<laughs> hello. Uh oh, hello. There we go. There we go. Um, I'm going to try it one more time just to make sure we're all here, actually here. Hello. Uh, my name is Deborah, and I'm the director here at YBCA. Um, very, very thrilled to have all of you here tonight. Uh, YBCA is um, an organization that was founded almost 25 years ago. I think there's some people in the room that could probably hardly believe that, thinking back. Um, and our mission is to generate culture that moves people. Uh, by this, we mean that set of things, the traditions, the stories, the values, the things that drive cultural movement. Um, and we think, inspired very much by the author Jeff Chang, who is also a YDCA board member, that it's culture that precedes change. Cultural movement can help us get to a new place, a new way of feeling, um, and we're here to do that. Uh, I can't think of an, another artist than uh, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, who has always been ahead of our time, always. Um, and we are so thrilled that we are able to present Civic Radar here at YBCA. We're very glad to be able to share that with all of you. Um, and we are so um, very happy to be able to have this conversation tonight. Um, so Lynn is joined uh, by filmmaker and artist Eleanor Coppola. Uh, and the, the conversation that you're about to get to take part of is uh, moderated by Amelia Jones, art historian, critic and curator, and vice dean of critical studies at the Roski School of Art and Design at University of Southern California. And tonight, this intimate moment, this intimate conversation is really going to focus on um, Lynn's lesser known early pioneering works of radical social performance and activism, 1960s, 1980s, around that time. Um, we are so glad to have you. And without further ado, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having us here. I'm particularly honored and thrilled to be talking to these two amazing women. I've been a groupie of Lynn's for years, kind of following her around and um, getting into her archive and all sorts of weird things. So it's really exciting. Um, so I wanted to first, I'm assuming everyone here probably knows Lynn and a lot about Lynn and possibly a lot about Eleanor, but I'm going to just give a very brief bios just to set the stage and move us into the discussion. Um, so Lynn, um, Lynn Hirschman Leeson has really over the last 10 years been showing internationally, right? And no, before that. Yeah, before that. Um, I was just it's, just. it's just not nationally and locally. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. Um, I was thinking of the first big retrospective, which was initiated by the Henry Art Gallery, and then a different version of that was brought to Manchester, where I was living at the time. Um, and then, of course, we're very fortunate to have a smaller version of the giant ZKM retrospective. Um, but Lynn is someone who anyone studying feminist art, new media art, experimental film, experimental video has known about for a very long time. Um, a central person in the development, really developing new media before anybody even called it that. And this show actually makes that really clear in a wonderful way. Uh, more recently, she has been making major feature length films including Women Art Revolution, um, Strange Culture, and uh, very recently just being released is Tanya Libra, a film about the um, social practice radical Cuban artist Tanya Bruguera that has already been accruing awards and will be showing here at Yerba Buena on April 11th. Um, Eleanor Coppola is someone whose work I knew more as the, the very famous Hearts of Darkness of Filmmakers Apocalypse, which is a kind of um, touchstone in documentary filmmaking about the making of Apocalypse Now. That was 1991. But I was actually really excited when you sent me the catalog to your recent show, Eleanor Coppola, Quiet Creative Force, which is a retrospective of her artwork held at the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art in 2014. And 
so this might be one of the touchstones we can, um, we can use to start a discussion is the incredible wealth of media that both of you have used and kind of what that's about in terms of the generation you, you each came out of, being in San Francisco, et cetera. Um, but the work in that catalog is really interesting. And um, of course, there is an intersection when the two of them meet in San Francisco and do some projects together. So we'll talk about that as well. Before we move into that, I also wanted to mention that um, Eleanor has also recently finished a film, Paris Can Wait, which will also be shown at Yerba Buena and is also receiving an award here. Um, and that's April 10th. And this is your first, right, fiction film, yes. your first feature length fiction film. So I wish I could be here. I know I'm going to try to see that as soon as it's available on my various screens. Um, look forward to that. So, yeah, yeah, I think in starting out, if you guys want to introduce the audience to how you met and talk a little bit about what moment that was and where it was and how that happened. Well, we were uh, in a carpool, and I had a three-year-old, and Eleanor had a four-year-old, and they were going to 150 Parker Nursery School, and that's when we met. And I think uh, uh, found um, happily <laughs> found that we had something to talk about with each other, and and it's still continuing. I had just moved to San Francisco and and uh, put our kids in school, and uh, I was very lonely and kind of desperate because I had lived all my life in Southern California, and as much as I admired San Francisco and really wanted to be here, and I liked the light and I just like the whole um, mood of Northern California. I just didn't know a single soul, and I was so kind of hungry for communication with another woman, and to uh, connect with Lynn was just a lifesaver for me. And the fact that she had far out ideas, and she didn't think I was, <laughs> she didn't think my ideas were, you know, off the wall at all. She was very. Uh, supportive and encouraging, and I uh, really, uh, she was a very important person to me during that early, those my early years in San Francisco because we used to get together. I mean, it was, it was hard, you know. I had a f house, and and uh, my husband's career was just taking off, and there was just a lot of obligations and things, and so my uh, getting together with Lynn always was like kind of the highlight of my uh, time during those years. Yeah, they they. Uh, Ken Casey had something called the Merry Pranksters, but I think, I think it was us first. And we used to get into a lot of trouble. Yeah, we'll get into that. Um, so I picture you playing and you're drinking wine and making trouble in the background. No, I think, I think you're making trouble right in the foreground. Oh, right in the foreground. <laughs> so the kids aren't even there. They're like off with someone else. Nursery school. Okay. Um, so, I mean, just... Maybe expanding on that, what elements in your backgrounds brought you together? What, you know, what kinds of creative energies did you feel you had in common? When did that emerge? Did that emerge immediately? Or just wondering what you thought that moment was where you felt that you had each other and you had this kind of creative risk taking in common. Well, I, th I think just having another person to talk to um, and who would uh, uh, kind of conspire with you on ideas that seemed appropriate but, but, but nobody else was doing or that didn't fit in the in appropriate art world, which we didn't either, uh, gave us, I think, a lot of courage to just go out and, uh, and uh, make these things uh, happen in the real world. And there were, there were adventures each time we did them. Uh, indeed. <laughs> uh, it's hard for many of you to imagine what the uh, social seeing the art world was at that period of time. I did a little uh, research, and uh, during this period, there were uh, there was one, in, I think in six years, there was one uh, museum show using, with a woman artist, and there were uh, 
six women artists over a period of like eight years who were in group shows of one or the other. But it was not a receptive period for women artists. And we both realized that we weren't going to be accepted into the, the, any of the mainstream kinds of uh, formats. And you know, what were some of our alternatives? And we began to sort of focus on that. Seventy, what the the Dante Hotel was seventy two, seventy three was, in early seventies. But you met 60s. you met like in sixty nine or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what made you both crazy enough to think you could be artists? I mean, after all, <laughs> <laughs> what it wasn't like you say it wasn't something that you would think you could do. There weren't examples, there wasn't a support system, there wasn't, you both had other things to do, you are both raising children. Well, I could never not do, be one. It was just the, the kind, you know, of, of what art was accepted yeah. by a particular uh, culture that was, uh, would not never have, have, uh, have accepted what I was doing. And, I, and Eleanor had been also uh, an artist, um, having done many uh, installations and fabric and textile work mm -hmm. um, that were uh, being shown. So uh, when we got together, we kind of started to think about ways that we could just uh, uh, do things that were more public right. and allow that we didn't really need museums or galleries since we couldn't get into them anyway, and just to find, find ways that we didn't really consider that radical at the time, but what seemed appropriate because uh, it it uh, it allowed us to do things that that uh, um, one couldn't under normal circumstances. So I think together we kind of garnered our courage and uh, went forward. Well, when some of the first work I saw of Lynn's was, uh, were drawings, and she is a really stunning uh, drafts person. I guess we don't say draftsman anymore, we say drafts woman. Beautiful skills in, in drawing, and as she said, she always knew that uh, she was an artist. Uh, I was kind of a wannabe artist, but I, I went to UCLA in the art department, and I was immediately put into the women's arts, how make a uh, um, house, uh, you know, interior design and weaving and jewelry making and um, all kinds of things that would be appropriate for women. And so I, I couldn't understand what my <laughs> problem was because I didn't. I worked in that field as a commercial artist for a while, but what was a seminal moment for me was in the late '60s uh, in New York. I saw. Um, who, uh, an artist that I had no idea existed, but I saw the work of uh, Agnes Martin. And I just really was like breathless. I couldn't believe it. And here was art that was being made that wasn't uh, depending on draftsmanship, because I wasn't especially uh, capable of that. But it was very expressive and beautiful and uh, just uh, sent me uh, onto the realization that I could make... Uh, uh, non draftsman drawings, of which I began to make a number of uh, works that were based on grids that were hand drawn as carefully as you could, and they were about the kind of the, the vibration between what looked like a sort of a perfect line but wasn't really, and uh, that kind of interaction. And, and so I was thrilled to see Lynn's drawings, which were so. Uh, brilliantly crafted and one which were coming from a different direction, but um, there were some things in common, I think, that we shared about that, too. I think around that same time, um, I was invited to Edinburgh, and I was on a panel, believe it or not, with, uh, with uh, Joseph Boyce and Tadeusz Cantor. Uh, and Cantor did a performance that first night that I was there, and that completely changed my view of, uh, of art and what art could be and the blue of art and, and, and the f what people call a fourth wall and going beyond the drawings you know, into real life and real time. So maybe we were doing the reverse <laughs> simultaneously at the same time. When was that, Lynn? Around 68, 69. 68, 69. Yeah. 
I'm learning all these things about Lynn. I didn't know. Thank you for <laughs> bringing us together. <laughs> I was wondering, too, how much, if anything, you either of you knew about the feminist art movement and also what was going on in San Francisco specifically in terms of performance or whether that was, you know, really a kind of a different marginalized, I mean, I know it was marginalized in relation to the main art world. Um, there wasn't really a, a very active feminist movement, at least that I found in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And I found it more in communicating with people like Suzanne Lacey in Los Angeles yeah. and knowing what was going on at Women's House and communicating with, uh, with people um, in New York, you know, in those days people used mail. <laughs> and, uh, but, but not so That's much. That's a good thing because otherwise you wouldn't have those papers in your archive. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was, um, you know, it was just really having one person to talk to um, yeah. and to have a dialogue with here. Uh, I think that in, in the early years of the feminist movement, people were trying to uh, were beginning to notice that they didn't have a history, a cultural history, or trying to invent one yeah. also, and, and that played into uh, kind of the freedom of uh, being able to push any boundary because it really didn't matter. Yeah. Literally, I mean, a lot of my work, I say, happens on the cusp of disaster. Something, you know, drove me to do it and as a rebellion to, uh, to, to systems that were um, repressed, and so, and, and so that, that kind of converted it uh, and reconverted it. Yeah. I was definitely not in, uh, in uh, the know of about feminist art in the area as the feminist movement sort of came to the fore in the mid-60s into my awareness. You know, I had two kids and I had an Italian traditional husband and the standard uh, uh, s sort of <laughs> information that was always reaching me is that these women are just uh, bitches, you know, <laughs> they're just, you don't want to be one of those, you know, there's hairy legs and n no deodorant and uh, strident and it's all of the things that were, um, you know, uh, depicted as not appealing at all. So I didn't really find out much about it or know about it because it was just already, um, put down as something very uh, unpleasant and you wouldn't want to be associated with. Ah, but then you found out. <laughs> you met Lynn. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so now we have a little bit of a picture of kind of this early moment and what's happening there. And maybe we can start moving into the stories of this extraordinary work that you did together. Um, so I don't know what you want to start with, but the two two big projects, for me at least, that, that are amazing are the Dante Hotel and then the reforming familiar environments. But if, if there's something else I may not even know about, I would love to hear about that too. Um, so it involved this kind of, it seems to me, kind of intuitive social critique that really started with fun and performance and kind of bringing people together into particular kinds of spaces, including your own home. So maybe you could just talk about those projects uh, so that the people in the audience who don't know about it can get a sense of what that was about, what the energy was. Should we do the dance? Do it chronologically? <laughs> so that, uh, I, was, I was thrown out of the University Art Museum because I used sound in one of my works. And I, I um, uh, the owners of whom are <laughs> sitting right here. Um, <laughs> um, and, 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 and really, I, I felt that there was nothing to lose. I mean, who needed a museum anyway? You know, I came out of the free speech movement and uh, and going be I started to think about going beyond systems and I would meet Ellie at the Cafe Trieste and we'd kinda of talk about this dilemma of of not uh, not having any cultural uh, home a representation and then we thought why not just rent a hotel room you know and so we did it in CD North Beach uh, a block away from the well I think before that we sort of considered all the options and at one point we thought we'll just rent a um, storefront you know and uh, if 
no gallery runs this, we'll make our own gallery. And uh, we really looked into that a bit and realized that if you have a storefront, you have to have somebody at the door that opens it up and closes it up and is there taking care of you know, the, the exhibition all during the time it's there. And it was something either of us could manage. We were, you know, <laughs> we had another life. So this is what we came up with. Yeah, because they, you know, they we, we converted people who lived in this kind of tenement um, uh, hotel, which I think was twenty-seven dollars a week um, to rent, and I Those had were to. The days. What, what? what? Those were the days. Those were the days, yeah. and I had to borrow that from Ali, I think, for the first couple of weeks to 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 do it, and um, and I put into my room uh, the things that weren't allowed in the museum, uh, which were the artifacts of somebody who could have lived in that in that room, and the sound that was uh, had been in the museum was converted there. But you, you had residents there, and you had people at the desk 24 hours a day, and and it just seems so much to make so much sense to just go there, get a key, and check in, and and uh, look at the room, and and uh, and you had a living person in yours. Yes, I thought the that the hotel was like the perfect venue for us because, as you said, people. It also broke down the barriers of like what time you could see art. You know, in the museums, you can see art between ten and six, and that's it. And what if you feel like seeing art at eight or you know or some other time. So by having this hotel uh, space, this hotel room, uh, people could come at any time of the day or night. It was always kind of fun to see somebody show up in their tuxedo after the opera at midnight or something. It was always open. All you had to do was go to the desk and get the key, go up to the room, have a look, and when you were finished, turn the key in and, and depart. And it was a 24-hour a day museum space for us. And yes, in my room I had... Um, a living person, a poet, and um, I was interested in time and how time, every minute is, every second is a, a new event in time and a new, um, a new experience, a new artwork, a, something uh, completely fresh and new each moment. And so I had him living in this room and I would go every few days and take a photograph of um, what his room looked like and how the the laundry piled up and then all of a sudden it would disappear and, and uh, then the towels would be scrambled and someday they'd be neat and sometimes the toothpaste was out. Sometimes It was just about the, uh, the change of inhabiting this space. And also anyone could go and see. Sometimes he was there, sometimes he wasn't there. And I only made one major mistake on the opening night. I really have always regretted this in my art life, is that I didn't just have him take his clothes off and get in bed, because he was in the room and people didn't really realize that he was <laughs> the artwork, the artwork, <laughs> sculpture. <laughs> uh, yeah, until a little later on, and, and sort of the word got out, and people came there and they realized that he was the person living in this room. And, and he, said, he has some funny stories to tell about you know, being asleep and somebody knocking on his door, coming in with a key, coming in the door, and uh, finding him there and you know, having a conversation and, and checking it out and leaving at you know, different hours of the day and night. So he's, he has a few stories. And, and people said, oh, it'll never last. People, you know, people will disrupt the room. They'll steal things. Um, and actually, uh, they were proud of it. I think that those rooms got listed as one of the ten best shows of the year, <laughs> along with Turner's Watercolor. <laughs> and, and people would, would come all the time. And the only time it was disrupted was when the police came in at 3 a.m. because somebody thought there was a dead body there. And they took all the parts. It was a year later. It lasted for a year because the... Uh, as I say, the residents and other people that, that lived there were really proud of it and took care of it. And and uh, and after the police took my uh, all the body parts away, it just seemed like the appropriate closure for. I think you have to you have to describe <laughs> what you had in there before the police taking body parts makes sense to people who don't know <laughs> your piece. So describe your Dante hotel room. Uh, the room uh, it, it consisted of wax. 
cast figures to women and artifacts of what they could have had um, uh, in their life. Everything was, was from that socioeconomic um, uh, uh, community. Um, diaries of, uh, you know, just the artifacts of living the sound, the sound of breathing. Uh, wallpaper that was made from photographs of the women themselves. So I always wondered how much you... I mean, did you move things around and change things, or was no. it really just you put it in and I, then... I put it in. I, didn't, I wasn't like Alan Capro's mother. <laughs> who would, uh, Alan Capro had a piece, uh, and, and his mother, it was people were meant to, to change it oh, right. as they went in, and his mother would come every afternoon and put it back the way <laughs> it started. So, I didn't I mean, know about that yeah. piece. That's amazing. Well, Lynn's room was very atmospheric. When you stepped inside, it was dark and it kind of had a greenish cast and there was a f uh, aquarium, a fish tank that was all kind of overgrown with, uh, you know, green slime. <laughs> and um, uh, but now the two women's, were two women's faces with a lot of hair sort of covering them, these wax faces of these women in bed and they were really uh, obscure and looked very, very realistic. And I think that's what uh, the police finally <laughs> were referring to, because it had a very, very realistic quality to the to the room. The lingerie was kind of flung over the chairs, and the, I mean, just it had a it was, it was a, a mood, an atmosphere, and an and a environment that was very unique. And at, at the time, nobody had seen anything like that, or since. No, I tried uh, about seven years ago. <laughs> they thought I was crazy. <laughs> no, I never. I wasn't able. To, I, I didn't. I mean, I just figured that was the end of the um, of the story. But then, uh, what? Oh, sure, they threw it out. <laughs> um, but then, uh, the, a few years later, we were invited to do something uh, by the San Francisco Museum. Uh, of art uh, for the Los Angeles Museum's Collectors Forum. Remember the reforming piece? And um, we figured they just wanted to have a party at your house. <laughs> I knew that this was all about. They wanted to come and see uh, where Francis Ford Coppola lived and, uh, and see his Oscars because they were kind of known to be in the case and he had five Oscars, which was like a you know thing to come and see. So. They all wanted to come and see uh, this house where we lived. And we did this, of course, when Francis was out of town. <laughs> and at, in those days, there was uh, a union of prostitutes called Coyote, Call Off Your All Tired Ethics. And I invited them to come and perform um, in your house. <laughs> and uh, so that they were interacting, either taking baths or sleeping or mingling with people. And, and the groups knew that there were some prostitutes there, but they didn't know who they were. <laughs> so, so, you know, part of this whole tension of that event, which we introduced through a closed circuit television uh, program in the living room, uh, yeah, was those prostitutes were somewhere yeah. uh, mingling. Well, we had this idea, which would never have been, uh, was like totally far out to me, but we had a screen room in the basement, and this room had been an old ballroom, because this is one of those big Victorian houses that 22 hippies were living in it when we bought it. And it was a white elephant, very cheap. And the, when we moved in, when we first got it, we were very excited, and the next morning we woke up, we were all eaten alive by fleas, because the, the hippies had had like four dogs in the house and nobody was there to eat anywhere for them to jump on. And so we jumped on us. My kids were covered. I counted 75 bites on Sophia's back or whatever. And it was just like a nightmare kind of situation. But in this old house, which had great bones, there was a, you know, a basement screen room. And we had the idea that we wouldn't meet the people who came to this um, event. We would just be down in the basement with a cl uh, closed circuit, there would be a monitor on the ground floor where the guests came in, and we would be down below, and we would just talk to them through the monitor. That we would we would just be electronic presences, and, uh, and then. But then we 
you also took your floor plan, and wasn't that the game board? Yes. <laughs> the, uh, which uh, didn't make uh, your husband all that happy that we were giving out <laughs> all of the, uh, the secrets of your home so for people to go and search for different things, uh, diff different objects, and uh, so that they could win a prize in this one night game that we had. So I'm going to have to tell you about her different rooms that she did, but um, mine were several. One bedroom I had, of, uh, my daughter and um, son were in this room, and I, it was a nice little museum cord over the doorway, and inside was uh, a video of me giving birth to <laughs> my daughter. But the screen was tipped a little bit. You could just hear the sound. Uh, you couldn't really see it. and the. The plaque on the door said, uh, two of the artist's most important works of art expected to take 21 years to complete. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot of kind yeah, of... And uh, peeling potatoes, too. Yeah, in the, in the kitchen, everybody who entered the kitchen, there was a uh, little sign, and there was a pile of potatoes, you were asked to peel a potato. And then uh, after you peeled it, you went to the next uh, little table, and it uh, said... Uh, uh, Joseph Beuys, who was very influential to me at that point in time, there was a quote from uh, Beuys that was, peeling a potato can be a work of art if it's a conscious act. And then we went to the next table and we decided if your potato was art or not art, and we put it in the appropriate pot. <laughs> And, you know, it, it was also, uh, you know, there, there were a lot of beat poets, and I had some in your elevator that were giving people rides and <laughs> stopping midway and give, reading their poetry to <laughs> strangers. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and um, I think Margot St. James was, uh, who founded Coyote, was in, in bed, and she would take, she would solicit money from people as they went into the room. Others were taking baths. Yeah, there was one in the bathtub on the third floor. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> right, and oh, uh, um, I think Francis found out about the the, the Oscar trick. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I, since I knew everybody was coming to see his Oscars, that was the the big draw. I at that time I didn't do any more, but at that time I, the man won the Oscar, and they gave his wife a little Oscar this big, a little gold Oscar on a, on a chain, you know, that you could wear proudly. <laughs> and so I had five of these little Oscars, and they had a little gold loop on the top, and I, I have a brother who was a, the jewelry, and he found off the little loop, and I put these perfect little gold, <laughs> five little one-inch high gold statuettes in the case where, where and I took out the, the, the big Oscars, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. All right, so, so now you have to say how people responded to this crazy, crazy house, this fun house. <laughs> What do you think? So they're expecting to come and see see Francis Ford Coppola's house and the Oscars, yeah. and, and instead <laughs> they see potatoes and prostitutes <laughs> and so what? How did what happened? What did people say? How was it? What was? The <laughs> well, they didn't say it to us. They didn't say it to you. Except so, the Maurice Techman thought I was part of Coyote. <laughs> so come on. What so that's actually hilarious, but, and this goes back to the Dante Hotel as well, two different audiences, right? Because the, the reforming familiar environments was the, the kind of museum people. Was there anyone else coming to that, or was it just that group of SF MoMA? What was the LA was it? Yeah, it was San Francisco and Los Angeles okay. County uh, Museum of, of oh. Collectors. And um, so we were trying to kind of subvert expectations. As, and again, you know, de dealing with, uh, with, um, with work that didn't fit into any venue that existed gave us a lot of freedom to do works that could interact in many ways. Um, in social settings that that ha hadn't existed before, like you know, for instance, uh, 
prisons and hotel rooms and yeah. and and um, and windows that we were going at one point to do our the windows of Bahamut Teller together, but uh, Ellie had to go to um, the Philippines. Yeah, we know that story. <laughs> well, we did another piece. Actually, uh, just one final note about the one uh, in our house. Uh, I think the the game board aspect of the floor plan and. There were a lot of other things. It was uh, a, one of my pieces was Joyce Goldstein changing, and I had right. uh, taken a photo of her wearing everything in her closet. So <laughs> exactly like every time I saw her, she was wearing something different, and she was she was really like a sculpture, you know. Each time, and she her, her she would be a, sort of a different person, you know. Her hair would be different. She'd be really super dressed, or she anyway. I took everything from her underwear to her uh, the whole way through and of course there was a lot of hippie funny clothes in the from that period but uh, I had her come and I had this the I printed the photographs all in a strip of long a piece that was around the length of this hall and um, she would come out one door in something and people would begin to realize that she was the person that was in those photographs right. and then she would go in the another door and uh, she came out again in something else in a different. So throughout the evening, she kind of, the kind of came up and down this hall in some of the you know, things that she'd been, uh, that she was photographed in. And I had, in, um, so anyway, the people were supposed to go around and find all these different things in the house. And um, for some reason, there was a conclusion in the dining room, and the prize was um, a multiple. And at that time, you know, like multiples were just kind of happening. Artists were making multiples, and mm -hmm. and uh, and it was like a deal to have a multiple. And this multiple uh, turned out to be uh, somebody won it, and was whatever the prize was. But the prize was uh, 25 sun-kissed oranges with a nice sun-kissed stamp on it. You know, that says the artist stamp of sun-kissed. <laughs> sun well, whatever it was that we could do was kind of. Uh, just sort of shake up the expectations was kind of part of our. Uh, so how this? I mean, the these are collectors or curators or both? Oh. Yeah. Uh, they so were too polite. To okay. <laughs> <laughs> so shocked. Well, not to, to really today, say anything. I'm sure today you would hear, but. Um, and the, the they weren't asked again. Uh, <laughs> clearly not. Um, and the Dante's Hotel, I was wondering, like, who was the audience and how did you publicize it, or was it just word of mouth? Um, I took one ad in Art Week, and I had a Xerox okay. um, that I put on some bulletin boards, and that was it. It was all word of mouth yeah, after that. that's what I figured. Yeah. And then also during that period, a little bit later, we did this piece when you were in um, at Edinburgh, and I was in uh, San Francisco. And we did it at the. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you can. You can. <laughs> well, you might. It, we're realizing that we both have a little bit of different uh, perspective and remembering <laughs> what really went on. But um, as I recall, Lynn was um, there, and and she was. Uh, going to do a piece at the same time I did a piece in San Francisco. She was going to do a piece in uh, Edinburgh, and we were going to sort of try to communicate with each other telepathically a little bit, I think, or something. <laughs> yeah, it was a drawing in time, right, where you, you and I were going to think about what the other person was going to draw <laughs> and draw it. <laughs> sort of. I, I, I did my piece on the rooftop of the San Francisco Art Institute, and um, it was at the same time you were doing something in, in Edinburgh. And that was the piece where you were drawing with the screen on the white wall. Yeah, I was using screen. And, and, taking fo and then you took photographs. Yeah, uh -huh, in the time. That's such an interesting, what, what gave you that idea? I mean, even to call that a drawing is an interesting thing to do. And what were you doing in your Side. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, clearly, yeah, the it's not in the book. Didn't I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you wrote, you wrote a letter. About, you wrote it, the whole description of that's in your papers. I saw that. Yeah. I should go read them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 
anyway. Oh, dear. <laughs> So that's the bad thing about a paper archive is you can't do a search on your computer to remind yourself <laughs> what you did. So, but we're all lucky that it's some of it's downstairs in the vitrines. Um, there was another story you had about going out, to, how you would go out together in the limousine, and can you talk about that? Which is a kind of, for me, a kind of performative choice. It was kind of a performance. You know, I have to say that um, uh, my husband wasn't enthusiastic about my making these things with Lynn and, and uh, <laughs> or Lynn. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and he really felt, I mean, it's, it's from the era, it's the culture. And at that time, I was really, uh, and I expected I was supposed to be that way too, so I wasn't in disagreement so much as just. Uh, anyway, I was supposed to be the good Italian wife who took care of the children and made the home nice and, uh, and supported her husband's career. And that was what my life mission was supposed to be, and I was supposed to be happy. In, France, in fact, I asked Enoch, why am I not happy? And, and she gave me the name of the psychiatrist to go see. Because <laughs> what was wrong with me? Because I couldn't... Uh, anyway, I didn't uh, see, I couldn't call myself an artist because I didn't see anything replicated around me that was the kind of art that I was interested in, so I must not be an artist, but I want to do these things and what's wrong with me? You know, I was always like, what is wrong with me? And I think that's typical of women in that era, too, of like, there's something wrong with you if you have these uh, other uh, uh, interests and concerns. And, and I think back of the... Uh, the piece, the, the yellow wallpaper, you know, that short story, which mm. many of you women probably know. Kate Chopin, yeah. Yeah, and isn't that, it's just, it's something wrong with her. The husband thinks something's yeah. wrong with her. She wants to write, for those of you who don't know yet, but she wants to write and her, and her husband thinks that uh, that's upsetting her and making her uh, ill, and so he takes her off to the country and... Uh, takes away all of her writing implements and no one, she can't have books or paper or pen or anything because that's what's making her sick or not normal because she's doesn't want to be the perfect housewife, I guess. And um, you know, little by little she does really go nuts and starts peeling away the wallpaper and da 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 da. But it's, a, it's that sense of there's nothing being mirrored around a, a creative person. And I think if you can't use your creativity, it turns against you. And um, that's why Lynn was such a lifeline because, you know, we would do these things together that we enjoyed and appreciated and learned things from. And, um, and even though there wasn't, you know, support from, uh, you know, from anybody else. I had another thought, but it's lost me now. I don't know. Where were we talking? What were we the talking limousine. About? Oh, the lim oh, okay. So a lim uh, Lynn and I would go to art openings and things, and, and my husband would never go, and her husband wasn't interested. And the two of us would go to uh, art openings and exhibitions and things that we wanted to do, and, uh, and uh, our husbands were never with us. And so uh, people began to think that we were a couple, and, <laughs> and uh, so it treated like, treated us like a couple, so when we were, uh, we, Went to, I had, Francis was out of town, I had two tickets to the opening of the San Francisco Film Festival, which in those days had kind of a red carpet and the whole thing. And so uh, I invited Lynn and uh, I rented a tuxedo. And Lynn had a gown and I had a tuxedo. And we just said, if you want to think we're a couple sequins, we're a couple. And so we went and we had, Francis had, we made Godfather. He, um, complained that as the director of this film, he was picked up every day in this crew vehicle. It was a, a station wagon, a rattly old station wagon with like four or five other people all squished into the station wagon. And he said, you know, how come as a, a director, I, you know, I don't even get a car <laughs> to take me to the locations. And, you know, and I said, no, no, no. And he said, no, he said, if, if this uh, film is successful, I want you to buy me a car. And uh, the producer said, yeah, 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 okay. And uh, he said, no, he said, I mean, I want you to buy me a, a, a big car. And, uh, and he said, so we need some deal anyway that if the film, if Godfather made $75 million, 
that he could buy any car of his wishes. So guess what? Everyone was surprised. When it hit, Francis, he watched very carefully, when it hit the $75 million mark, <laughs> he went down in his Honda, I don't know if you remember those first little Hondas were like a little square box, <laughs> went down in his corduroy suit you know, with uh, George Lucas in his plaid shirt, and the two of them went in there and, and into the Mercedes Benz showroom on Van Ness, and the, they said, we want to buy that car, and it was like a uh, the, the six door one, you know, the three doors on each side, and the sun with the kind of Pope drives. <laughs> and uh, the salesman comes out and, and he says, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he passes him to the next lower junior salesman, and he comes out, and Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they pass him to this like 24 year old kid, first time ever salesperson. And uh, and I said, yes, we want to buy that and, and uh, send the uh, bill to Bob Evans at Paramount Studios. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, long story short, we had this big, uh, crazy limousine. And so when it, I took, we got a driver and we took this limousine to the, to the uh, film festival. And then and I stepped out of this uh, ground limousine <laughs> at the festival. It's this couple. <laughs> Yeah, but we would, uh, or Ellie would, <laughs> have that car available to us whenever Francis was <laughs> with <some attempt. laughs> And I remember we, we went once to Santa Cruz with Tom Mariani, <laughs> who got sick um, on the car. <laughs> he was going around the cruise, I think, <laughs> and he vomited all over the <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about Tom Mariani, but that wasn't what was in my mind. It's him getting sick in your limousine. But, so you knew him, and you knew because he was very important to the performance scene here, obviously. And Tom Mariani was a really important person to me because he had this museum of contemporary, or, um, right? Um, yeah, contemporary conceptual, conceptual art. Sorry, yes, yeah. thank you. Museum of conceptual art, and I was so interested, you know, and I was this housewife with not very much time in my hands, and so I made an arrangement with him. I paid him $25 to come to his uh, place for an hour and have him give me a lesson about conceptual art so I could learn about it. And, of course, he thought I was like this, I mean, what did he think? This woman from Pacific Heights comes down there to, to this, his place over the a bar on the, right here, around the corner, close by, and and so he, he kind of just sort of indulged me, but, and I learned a lot from him actually, but he totally just blew me off as uh, this dumb lady, and, uh, you know, and so sometimes he'd show up and sometimes he wouldn't. And for me it was like really important, I had to get a babysitter, I had to work everything out, I had to get myself down there, and I wanted this intense little hit of of uh, learning about these different things, you know, learning about Les Levine and all kinds of things I didn't know. I visited him, hmm? remember? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was funny. We <laughs> were in New York, and uh, Les Levine had all these things that he would do. He, he had a, what, do you remember that? Like it's sort of a catalog for 23 cents he would do yeah, this. You could, you, could, uh, you could hire him to do anything if you paid him. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he lived on Mulberry Street in New York, and so we were there. And we went to the door, and he came out and looked at us like we were like, complete <laughs> freaks. <laughs> and he didn't, uh, but I remember that you brought Tom Mariani to give lessons at your house one night I was there. And here, I think, Finn Winters was there, and Orna Herzog, and <laughs> Peter Bedanovich, and oh a number of your... Uh, other people who were, uh, who happened to be in town, Dennis uh, Hopper, and he was talking about urinating into, <laughs> into that uh, uh, basin. Um, <laughs> That's a, a performance piece, you know. <laughs> and these are all filmmakers who like have like been through the trenches of like trying to do something really, really hard, and they were so angry that this guy was considered an artist. Uh, because he stood on a ladder and, and peed into a bucket below. <laughs> yes, that, that would have been a moment to be there. I'm sorry I missed that. Um, 
that's a good segue actually to talking a little bit about the film and the fact that I mean you've actually just you've become you're an artist but you've become really film is kind of your main medium now <laughs> well I wouldn't say that <laughs> because my because my husband's <laughs> sitting here <laughs> <laughs> doesn't want me making more films. I see, okay. <laughs> but she, <laughs> mine doesn't so either. That, 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 was, that was the great imp impetus to make another film. <laughs> All right. Well, we won't talk about it as a future possibility then, um, but you have made a lot of films, and I'm super interested in, you know, what that meant for you both first of all coming out of the San Francisco scene and this I had no idea about this Tom Marioni that's an amazing story so obviously you knew about the conceptual art body art stuff that was going on and so what was it about film I mean obviously Eleanor you couldn't escape it um, but for both of you maybe from different points of view what was it about film that became such an important vehicle for Things that I know, Eleanor, earlier in your career and up to the present, you were interested in this kind of concept of environment and what surrounds a person and what can be art around you. And how does that relate to film and how does it relate to your, the stuff you were doing in the 60s and 70s? Um, well, I, I, mean, I had made some commercials, you know, to advertise works I did in Las Vegas and in hotel rooms. Um, so that was, that was kind of my first filmic experience, um, commercials for myself, in fact. Um, and uh, I would go to Ellis House because I didn't go to film school, but, you know, I would go there and they would, you would show films every night. And all these people were making films. It didn't look so hard to me <laughs> to do it. <laughs> and they were riding around in those limousines. If I was a single mother. <laughs> I hope you told them it didn't look so hard. <laughs> uh, that would go over well. And, you know, I thought, you know, I wanted also to expand the audience outside of the, the museum or a very secular uh, 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 way of looking at these things and, and broaden the idea of if you're going to do something, try to do it with a with a, another set of um, uh, a group of people that uh, weren't in the art world. So that's also a totally different audience potentially. Yeah. 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 And and way of showing work. Yeah. And it and also you know. Uh, it, it combined everything for me because it was a combination of, of time and space and narrative and uh, and fracturing and uh, and paint, you know being able to use colors like paint. So it, it combined all the varying elements uh, of other pro installation projects mm. that I had been working with. And even like I mean, techno lust is par excellence. The the kind of narrative film that is nonetheless about all sorts of new biotechnology. I mean, it's a science fiction film. It really isn't. <laughs> how, how I mean, not? most of the script was was uh, conversations with scientists, and everything in Technolus is a science much fact film. Then uh, it's sci true, we call it sci true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I stand corrected. <laughs> It's yeah. kind of it's it's very goofy though the way the science gets played out, which is its charm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, there's an essence of truth. I was saying earlier that that uh, Rosetta Stone, who's the the key protagonist of the film, spoke with her uh, self-replicating automatons through a microwave. <laughs> so yeah, who knew that was going to be a political issue in 2017. <laughs> And Eleanor, I can't imagine how intimidating and complex it would be from your point of view and from your position, being brave enough to make films. How did you, I mean, how did you get started with that? How did you move into that? Well, it started with um, the documentary that I made during Apocalypse Now. I'd never imagined myself making a film, but um, in the circumstance there, I was desperate because I had been gone to the Philippines, put my kids in school, and there I was. Everyone had a job but me. There were 250 people out there, three women, and they all had jobs. And I was, again, just isolated and desperate. And when um, my 
husband was asked to, uh, they said he was told by the production company that was sending a documentary team out to, to make some, uh, get some footage because in those days they did it, these little five minute shorts on uh, like advertisements on television to tell about the coming uh, films. And Francis was already in deep trouble. He didn't want anybody to come out and snoop around and really photograph what was going on. So he said, oh, never mind, we'll do it in the house. And we looked around, there was nobody that didn't have something to do but me. And um, <laughs> So by default. <laughs> so by default. And I had made a few little, very short films, uh, some 30-second commercials, art commercials. Like, for instance, the Joseph Boy's Peeling a Potato can be a work of art if it's a conscious act. I made like a 30-second commercial, uh, which I wished, I, I was trying to get onto cable television because I said, so, Jimmy, there's all these commercials about buying toothpaste and deodorant and all these things. Why don't we have like some ones that give an idea or a thought or a piece of art in 30 seconds? And um, I was, I never got them on anywhere at any time, but that was what I was trying to do. And I made a four-minute piece and things like that. So we knew that Francis knew that I was kind of... And that was pretty early. Calm. That was like in the late 60s or early 70s? Early 70s, yeah. yeah, that I was doing that. So when I got there, anyway, I got this camera. I went in the dark. I learned how to load the magazine and learned how to operate it, more or less. And I started off, I said, sooner or later I'm going to get five minutes of material out here. And right away I was just enthralled by looking through that little square frame, framing up anything. And, and um, so, anyway, long story short, I it came back with 60 hours of material. <laughs> <laughs> and I got very intrigued with the, the creative process, like, oh, what Francis's creative process was. And, um, you know, th that ended up sort of being the focus of, mm -hmm. I, I thought it was going to be about explosions and the, da -da -da -da, the military, blah, blah, but it, it, I, that became my interest and focus. I, th I think also that you have to remember in those days, you know, J James Baldwin was writing about mm. the projection of uh, culture on individuals and how that affected individuals' sense of themselves. And if you're living in a culture where you're kind of demonized for who you are and you don't fit into that anyway, that to have a friend, you know, who mm. doesn't laugh at you, who encourages you, is is uh, such a treasure, you know, and, and such a, a a means of uh, of confidence for going forward. And also, I should mention that I had been quite ill in the '60s and wasn't expected to live through uh, various uh, a, uh, a physical health crisis. And having the experience of understanding how frail time is and that we are as creatures of living creatures also made it quite easy because the stakes stakes were such that you had nothing to lose mm. you know it wasn't it wasn't a life-threatening thing to do so that you could push any boundaries whatsoever and enjoy it and have, have a have a pal to laugh at uh laugh, laugh with at, at what one one was doing well we've all benefited yeah um i wonder if we want a little bit of time for the audience to ask questions. Yeah? Oh, George has, wait, George has something to say first. I, I, I would like to make a comment. I think that both of you, uh, through your lifetimes, have run into formidable barriers of entry, both in the film world and in the art world. And I would like to know now well, how those barriers have changed. Are they, are, they, are they falling faster in the film world or in the art world? Mm. <laughs> well, what's happening in the art world is that there are young women who have been born feeling entitled and confident, and uh, women are now curators and directors and critics and uh, making great strides understanding uh, the changes that are necessary. And it's really uh, very gratifying to see the shift happening in the art world where women are helping uh, other women to, uh, in, in various uh, uh, forms. I don't know about the film world. Well, there's different, I mean, the art world is a, 
multi-layered industry. So obviously there's lots of activity on the mm -hmm. levels that don't involve as much money where women and people of color and queers are welcome. Um, but as you get higher and higher and there's more and more money, it gets almost as restrictive, I think, as the film industry. But the film industry has been getting its butt kicked over the last few years. Over, I mean, finally. I don't know why this is only happening now, but all the criticisms of the, the mainstream Hollywood industry and how white and how male it still is. Yeah. This is tied to that question. For the first, I don't know, 30 years of your career, who did you think your, your marketplace was? I didn't think about it. Think I just figured there wasn't one. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. And, and it, didn't, it didn't phase you. It wasn't part of your thinking, and you didn't think it was a loss or a disappointment. No. And not only that, was a great thing that that work didn't sell. <laughs> As I have it, have most of it now when it is selling. So, <laughs> you know, it, it just, you know, you do, you, do, you do the work. And if there's no mark, I mean, in a way, it's very liberty. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like technology. Technology has no ethic. It's neither dystopian or utopian. It's what we do with it. And the experience of not selling work, you know, one could say, oh, I'm, terrible, my work's no good, I'm not going to do any, I'm, not, I'm going to get rid of all of it. Or you just, you know, put it under your bed and you, you keep it and keep working, keep pushing an edge and a creative idea um, as far as you can. And I think that's really, again, is valuing time and what one has as a unique uh, individual uh, in the planet on the planet and to, uh, to do things that uh, towards sustainability of one's spirit. Well, well, yeah, that's that's a beautiful statement, Lynn. Yeah, thank you. Lynn had a great sense from the beginning of from, from my knowing her from the beginning of kind of history, and that history had always been written by men, and that um, and that her work had value and it was important, and even if nobody was buying it at the time, she had the good sense to um, value it and put it under her bed or put it in storage or keep those uh, works. And I think many women, including myself, uh, you know, said, oh, and nobody wants this and nobody's interested in this and I'm moving and throwing it away, you know, along the way. And uh, you know, a sense of, of history and time and the importance of keeping a record of yourself as an artist and, uh, and the work you were doing. And I admire her a lot for that. And I just had a show last month in New York of uh, many pieces ranging from the late 70s to, to uh, just a few months ago. And, they've, and, and they're famous pieces. They've been written about. They're in a lot of books. They've never been shown in New York. And uh, someone mentioned that they're so happy to see them. And it had the patina of time on them, you know, that, that they weren't seen and that they gathered all that, uh, you know, that, that invisibility uh, created layers so that when it, you know, finally was seen, there's a different sense of how one looked at it and also the language for how one perceived it. Yeah, in the center there. I, I want to say also, I, was dri I remember once when I was very young, I, I got the job of driving Louise Nevelson around when she was in town. She had a show with the young. And she said that when she had her first show, uh, it, it was a failure. Nobody wanted anything. She took the entire show and threw it out her window, <laughs> destroyed everything. And I, I remember that, you know, what, 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 what a shame that was. It's like, it's like a death of, uh, of one's, um, uh, of, of, of something that, that one was pursuing with their time. But you had a lot of courage to keep uh, saving your work and, and feeling like that one day it would be seen or something, that it had some kind of value. I think uh, as women had no sources reflecting back that, that their work had value, that they, it was very hard to value it. And I think it took a lot of courage and uh, you know vision that you uh, did value your work and keep it. Okay, we have a question in the middle of the... She's ask Elizabeth Thomas. Yeah, let's, she's been waiting and then we'll go. Yep. Uh, as a woman artist working in media, I already thought about this situation here. How 
was it when you went to Europe, uh, for example, at the, you were in the United, you were making residences at Cannes, um, and uh, how was it as a woman working in India? Uh, it was actually the early 80s. It wasn't a residency, but I was invited to show some work there, show deep contact um, at, that, at that time. It was great. Um, it was wonderful. It's wonderful to have the support and to have a venue that uh, that didn't automatically reject something that dealt with media. So and, and it wasn't you know it was uh, I had a lot of uh, friends uh, in Europe, in Canada, uh, in the UK that uh, that supported work that uh, went beyond beyond what had been uh, previously considered art. I think it's really important to laugh yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, and 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 to play and to push things you know with that uh, you know looking underneath and, and with that sarcasm yeah. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I, I remember when I when I did my project in San Quentin, and I would go there in these pinstripe suits <laughs> and look, <laughs> try to look like a criminal attorney <laughs> as going in there. <laughs> so, definitely disarming. Uh, no, but I also really appreciate humor, and I'm an avid fan of Saturday Night Live or whatever some of these things are. Uh, so if it can have a little something that you know lifts your spirits, I mean, it isn't taken so super seriously. Maybe it's because nobody was taking us seriously that we just sort of fell into this other uh, mode. But um, my, the feature film I just made now, I, I like the fact that people come and laugh, you know. I think that's, uh, and to me, that's a virtue. Yeah. Thank God for the millennials. Don't compare Roberta Brightmore to Donald Trump, please. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I appreciated political theater, and I also appreciate improv and humor. And when I work with Tilda Swinton, that's what we do. We're the only ones very often laughing. 
um, and, <laughs> and write a script and then don't use it. So, because things are fresher that way, it, again, it, it kind of pushes a, an edge. And uh, I mean, it's important, I think, to uh, to have that kind of satirical wit that is uh, the underbelly of, of important philosophical statements. Uh, well, when, when I did the when when Ellie and I did the the hotel rooms and then some some store windows, it seemed to me why not make a vehicle that would allow other artists to uh, work beyond um, beyond traditional means because it was so easy so easy and uh, reached such a different audience. And so I created something that's downstairs called the Floating Museum. And one of the projects that we did early on was to take the walls of San Quentin and um, and convert them into murals, and we had a, we had a contest in San Quentin with the inmates for them to submit drawings, and we would uh, and uh, what we finally selected was um, was what the wall would look like if the wall wasn't there, and then brought in a muralist and uh, and had inmates actually paint that during that time. That was one of the early projects. And this it existed for twenty years before they painted it over. Wow. So maybe one more question. I just have a question for Eleanor. At the Dante Hotel was the poet in the room a man named Tony. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Tony Dingman. And whereas Lynn's uh, uh, installation stayed for, as you said, a year, uh, Tony got tired of living in the hotel after about three months, and, and uh, my piece ended. It's run. I'm surprised he lasted that long with people barging in in the middle of the night. Free rent. Yeah, free rent. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was really a wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much.